If you grew up in one of the many Ford cities in this country, you would very likely know about Henry Ford. But with a town like Plant City and the deep roots in agriculture that go with it, many people don't realize that the city's name is not in honor of a crop. The name Plant City did not originate from our heritage in green peppers, oranges, grapefruit, cantaloupes, tomatoes, or what is that other crop? Oh, strawberries, of course. But rather, our name honors a very important man. Who is the man behind the name? There are some wonderful books that deal with his life and work, full of fantastic information about his achievements that go far beyond Plant City and its intersecting railroad lines. Not only people here should remember his name, but so too should people of Tampa, Port Charlotte, Punta Gorda, Key West, Apalachicola, Kissimmee, Mobile, Sanford, Boston, Havana, and many more cities and ports. So who was he? Henry Plant was born in 1819 and lived a long, full 79 years to within six months of the turning of the century. Henry Plant biographer Kelly Reynolds gives a perspective to keep in mind by saying simply, quote, most people born in 1819 would never see indoor plumbing or kerosene, much less electricity, end quote. Years later, the people of his time described Plant as a self-made man, astute, a fundamental businessman. But his childhood was humble and hard. Henry Plant suffered the loss of his father and two siblings to a typhus epidemic that nearly killed him as well when he was only six years old. And like many of his time, he went to work at an early age. A good student in his youth, Henry was offered a chance to go to Yale for the divinity track and a career in the church. But young Plant thrilled to be independent and on the sea. So at 18, he struck out to find his own way, briefly working first as a livery stable boy. And shortly thereafter, he took his next job in 1837 on the waters of New York and Connecticut in a new steamship of the large line run by the often unscrupulous robber baron Commodore Vanderbilt. Fresh and green, Plant was in the forecastle, a rough place both in enduring the waves and in housing the roughest set of a crew. He was smart and early seen as trustworthy and capable and quickly became valuable to the captain. Here he was exposed to what was emerging as an express line, and in Vanderbilt he could see one example of empire building, the way of a ruthless, pitiless tyrant engaged in sabotage and or widow robbing was a contrary example to him. Though always loyal and grateful to his Vanderbilt employer, we will see how this impacted Plant later in his career. Young Henry Plant loved the people and the adventure of the water, but he also had grown to love a Miss Ellen Blackstone, whom he married five years later in 1843. She was a daughter of a wealthy legislator of note and prominence, and Henry took a position with Adams Express Company, now on the land side, more suited to the family man he promised to be. The Adams Company was a growing and soon-to-be-dominant leader in what was the express business, and Henry quickly rose there in success and prominence. He and Ellen had their first child, who died unexpectedly at age one and a half, and then in 1851, Morton, Henry Plant's sole heir, was born. So what was the express business anyway? It was the transportation and handling of messages, money, mail, packages, and people from place to place. Back then, it was very complex, involving multiple modes and multiple business contacts to accomplish, from messenger boys on foot to steamships full of cargo to railroad trains crossing state lines. Express shipments were increasingly carried by the power of steam. We take it for granted now with UPS, FedEx, telephones, and the Internet, but keep in mind that Morse code and the telegraph were less than five years old at that time. Even 61 years later, when Henry Plant died in 1899, New York was still only 10 stories high or less. By his early 30s, after 10 years, Henry Plant had worked to be prominent and trusted in the express business. But sadly, his wife Ellen was failing in health with tuberculosis. Slowly, it sapped her strength so much that Henry took time off in the winter of 1853 to bring her south all the way to Jacksonville, Florida, to provide some rest from the harsh winter. He literally went from Wall Street to a savage backwoods river swamp. Jacksonville weren't no big town at that time, and neither was Tampa. At that time, Tampa boasted barely 500 souls, no railroad service, and no transportation inland save for horse and buggy in what had recently been, at times, hostile Indian territory. Despite its primitive state, the trip to Florida filled Plant with dreams and ideas. The Plants returned north during the next year, but Henry wanted to relocate to the south for Ellen's sake and the family moved to Augusta, Georgia permanently to head up Adams Express growing concerns in that region. During this time, Augusta would leap forward with crisscrossing railroad lines and become the second largest city in Georgia. From his arrival in 1854 to the looming Civil War in 1861, Plant commanded and expanded the Adams Express Company influence and connections across Augusta, Charleston, Montgomery, Richmond, Vicksburg, Atlanta, Savannah, and more. 
Quickly, Henry Plant became known, trusted, and revered by his Southern customers and employees as he already was by his Northern employers and associates. When Ellen died just before the outbreak of the Civil War and young Morton, now age 10, was sent back north to family there for his education and upbringing out of harm's way during the war, it is worth noting how Henry Plant entered his early prime, a widower with few day-to-day -day family strings and a unique perspective and grasp of most every mode of steam power and communication on land and water. After shots were fired in April of 1861 at Fort Sumter, the Adams Express Company was operating in two countries at war with each other. Quickly, everything south of the Mason-Dixon line needed to be severed and closed or sold, with few buyers able or willing to be fair. And here is a moment where Henry Plant distinguished himself from his first employer, Vanderbilt. Henry believed business could be shrewd and hard, but not criminal. He preferred to beat the competition with value, not sins against it. Thus, though likely able to force a steal, Henry negotiated a more reasonable buyout price for the Adams Express Company's southern assets. By not alienating the northern financiers, he later would enjoy many of those men's support for mammoth projects in his future. The first act of what became his Adams Southern Express was both compassionate and patriotic, as Plant offered free shipment of Confederate soldiers' clothing packets. Confederate government contracts for payroll and tariff delivery shortly followed, and these, along with other key essential services, provided good profits to Plant and a bonus to key Adams employees and an exemption from military duty. For two and a half years, Henry worked tirelessly to survive and profit during the war, always performing with duty and honor. But in a very well-timed bout of exhaustion, and on advice of his doctors, he took leave of the operation and expatriated as much of his personal funds as he could to safe haven currencies until the war was over. After the military defeat of the Southern Confederacy, Henry Plant returned to Georgia and brought with him nearly a half million dollars of investment capital to form the National Bank of Augusta. He renewed business relationships with former investors and associates from up north and quickly began to build his own empire. He preferred to begin mainly in Georgia, as Florida, due to its inability to issue new land grants, was still in a worse railroad hell than most of the South. Florida had experienced a previous and ugly bond failure dating back to 1855 with much failed politics regarding railroads in the state. Thus, Florida was not as ripe for Plant's express business expansion as Georgia, at least not yet. It is important to note here Henry Plant's friend from the pre-war Adams Express days in the North. In 1868, former Abraham Lincoln presidential ambassador and aide to the Secret Service of the Union cause, now General Henry Sanford, pursued an increasing fascination with Florida. He purchased over 12,000 acres in the Kissimmee Valley at the source of the St. Johns River and began working for his far-reaching dream to develop citrus and other agriculture production in that area for shipment to northern markets. Sanford's view expanded to include dreaming of a canal system that later was actually realized between the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean via Okeechobee. Much of Sanford's achievements and dreaming was only south of Plant's expanding efforts by a few hundred miles. They were good friends and associates through the Adams Express Company since before the war, and it became inevitable that the two were bound to work together in the South. Though very busy in the post-war South, struggling to rebuild commerce and his express shipment company, in 1873, after eight post-war years of rapid growth across multiple states, Henry Plant took time to remarry. He knew Miss Margaret Lohman from her many years of service in being the housekeeper and caregiver to young Morton back home up north since the outbreak of the war and the death of Ellen. Always disciplined and proper, Henry did not engage a romance with Margaret until after Morton attained the age of 21, and the resulting marriage was not a liability to his past or future. Plant even retained a good relationship with his powerful former in-laws, the Blackstones, and their many influential northern friends. Some of them would later be major investors with him and his Florida dreams. At the time of his second marriage, the South was still largely in ruins, and a nationwide depression had stymied many attempts to rebuild. Though much of the South at that time was for sale at war-torn prices, northern buyers were often despised. Yet Henry Plant was trusted and not treated with hostility because he had time in before and during the war. Put simply, he was not cast as a dreaded carpetbagger, rather a bright young man reaching the pinnacle of his prime with dreams not only to trade on, but to rebuild the South. Henry was uniquely possessed of vision in how to vertically integrate what had always been a complex web inside any express shipment. Instead of dealing with four to eight businesses to complete a transaction, why not own them all? Being a futuristic mind, he focused first on the railroad and steamboat aspects of his express interests and began acquiring several such companies. By the late 1870s, Plant had rescued several railroads from foreclosure, 
and added great talent to his plans for expansion in the person of Colonel Henry Haynes. He invited General Sanford to participate as the boundary between their dreams shrank. Plant wanted to go further south on both coasts of Florida, so also in 1880 he acquired the charter of the East Florida Railroad and built the line from Jacksonville to St. Mary's River, intending to connect it to his Georgia Railroad empire. Despite Florida laws aimed at forcing freight to support only steamships when crossing between the states, Plant creatively circumvented politics with a Waycross subsidiary company, and he crossed the river between Georgia and Florida on two docks that just happened to have rail upon them, and they looked a lot like a bridge. In one dark night, the two rail docks were swiftly joined with a silver spike. As his railroad service in Florida stretched out and down, Henry Plant began to desire more control over steamship service near to his rail interests. He commissioned his first steamboat, the H.B. Plant, which operated the St. John's River. She was launched in 1880 and rang in at 137 feet long by 27 beam by 6 feet draft. She delivered 12 knots. The Plant family essentially lived on board for several years, based often in Savannah, Georgia, with Margaret and son Morton very happy aboard. The H.P. Plant lived a busy 10 years until burning to the waterline in 1890. But shortly after moving on board, Plant was busy gaining control of several steamship lines operating on several inland rivers of Florida and Georgia. 1881 and 82 were pivotal years for Henry Plant and all of Florida's future, as he founded his Plant Investment Company with the combination of his steamship and railroad investments and a large block of new capital from investors from both the North and the South. Though to focus on rebuilding in the South, Henry Plant was careful to populate his company with prominence across both sides of the Mason-Dixon line, including General Sanford and his former in-law, Blackstone. Future railroad magnate of the Florida East Coast, Henry Flagler, was also an early investor with Plant Investment Company, though at that time he was just growing his interest in Florida and not yet finished with his wildly successful standard oil dealings with the Rockefellers. It is interesting to note how, though nearly 30 years after Plant and Ellen had, Flagler traveled to Florida to offer relief to his dying wife's lung congestion made worse by harsh northern winters. While they did not exactly become fast friends, these two Henry gentlemen spurred each other to grand dreams and their eventual successful growth in fathering what was the heyday of Florida's coming of age. Though competitors, when Plant died in 1899, Henry Flagler was an honorary pallbearer. Henry's first goal after creating his Plant Investment Company was to finish researching and commit to a choice for what he would make the port of the Florida Gulf Coast. He wanted water access further south on the west coast of Florida to be a shipping outlet. At that time, Cedar Key was the prominent port of sorts, as it had the only rail service in the region, though a rather pitiful pre-Civil War narrow-gauge affair. Henry came to the local pencil factory town leaders and negotiated, but they attempted to double-cross and restrict him, and he began looking at Tampa. Henry did not object to the Cedar Key leaders' shrewdness, but rather to their lack of integrity. Legend has it that he was upset enough to break his reputedly stalwart calm demeanor and erupt with, I'll wipe Cedar Key off the map. Owls will hoot in your attics and hogs will wallow in your deserted streets. Leaving Cedar Key never to return, Mr. Plant next considered Bradenton, Port Charlotte, and Manatee, but he quickly settled on Tampa, mainly because there was nothing much there. At that time, William Henderson and Captain John Miller had Tampa's general store, and they ran small steamships on the Gulf. But there was no rail in the southern half of the state. Railroad construction had been attempted to connect Sanford, Florida to Tampa, but this effort, originally chartered in 1875, failed due to capital shortfall by 1882 after only reaching Kissimmee. The last gasp of that little narrow-gauge railroad from Orlando to Kissimmee saw Henry Plant on its inaugural run. He was there to fix it and buy it, and his Plant Investment Company purchased controlling interest in the South Florida Railway. For a railroad to cross the state of Florida and connect Tampa to Plant's other southeastern rail systems of Georgia and beyond, he needed two main things. One, a line from Jacksonville south to Palatka, and two, to cross the 70-plus miles of thick subtropical forest, swamp, and wetlands of central Florida to the Gulf Coast of Tampa. In 1883, Plant reached out to the Jacksonville, Tampa, and Key West Railroad and started them from Jacksonville towards Palatka. Their state charter allowing service to Tampa was set to expire in January 1884, but carried a large bonus of incentive land per mile, larger than the South Florida Railway charter bonus. One charter offered 3,840 acres per mile, but the Jacksonville, Tampa, and Key West charter, taking away rapidly, gave 10,000 acres per mile. This only left seven months in which to complete the connection for the bonus acreage. No one, no one except those who knew him, believed it could be done, especially during Florida's rainy season. 
Colonel Henry Haynes was assigned the task, and from June 1883 to January 1884, the 74 miles of track from Kissimmee to Tampa were completed. Plant used every steamship resource, including his HB plant, to aid Haynes in achieving this success. It took thousands of laborers, many of whom perished from disease and harsh conditions. The work ran from both ends, with resources, materials, and labor pouring in from Tampa and down the St. Johns River. And since trains of that era required water cooling stops every 25 miles, several towns along this route literally sprang up, and they were named in honor of the near miracle of rapid progress. Haines City, honoring Colonel Haines, is one such town, and Plant City, honoring Henry Plant, is another. Essentially, the entire I-4 corridor of today remains along this original route and is lasting testament to the power of the creation of this east-west conduit of transportation across the state. In 1884, completing the railroad connection was not the end, but rather a new beginning for Henry Plant's vision, for now it expanded to include enhanced freight and passenger steamer service to Cuba from Tampa. However, Tampa's port was still rather pitiful at that time, and building Tampa into a genuine port with a city to match it became of great importance to Henry's vision, so he decided to do both. In 1884, Plant constructed two earthen piers extending a mile into the bay with rail service for larger steam freighter loading capability. But Tampa Bay waters were not deep enough for the newer steamships on the horizon. No problem for Plant now on a roll. He simply dredged a 20-plus mile long channel from an average depth of about 9 feet to 20 feet in six months. Henry Plant's vision of the Florida Gulf Coast expanded again to include an increasing focus more towards having cities both of commerce and tourism capabilities. He began to work diligently to give visitors to the state something to recreate with and to celebrate. In 1885, Plant commissioned the construction of Mascot to become Tampa's steamship. She was state-of-the-art engine technology and would be fast and famous with a long career lasting until 1931. Right at 200 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 12 feet deep, she was capable of 15-plus knots. The Tampa Tribune described her then, saying in part, one of the most handsome and complete steamships of the sea, its appointments being in every respect really luxurious. Still today, Tampa's city seal, designed 40 years later in the 1920s, shows the name of this ship, but sadly an image of a full-rigged sailing vessel adorns the seal instead of Plant's mascot. From 1884 to 1887, the Plant Investment Company interests were expanding in three southeastern states, as was his ocean-going steamship coverage. In addition, Plant's work in building tourism and growth of passenger service, as well as freight shipments in Florida, is demonstrated by his building hotels along many of his train stop towns, several of which were resorts. Simultaneous with this tourism effort, the beginnings of a Florida phosphate product and fresh discoveries in Bartow came to Henry's attention, and he ordered construction of a narrow-gauge railroad from Lakeland to Bartow and on to Arcadia at the Peace River, where it would connect a service to Charlotte Harbor at Punta Gorda. Quickly, Plant Investment Company was ready to ship Florida's next big product via rail and freighter service. Henry Plant's next major steamship commission was the Olivet. Like her predecessor, Mascot, the Olivet was named by Margaret Plant in honor of a French composer that she fancied, Edmond Adran. It may be interesting to note how Henry and Margaret were both fans of the arts and music, though Henry's tastes ran more to the classic music of Haydn, Handel, and Mozart. Olivet was 275 feet long, with a 35-foot beam and a 12-foot draft. From 1887 to 1889, the Olivet set speed records from Tampa to Key West, Sand Key to Havana, and Tampa to New Orleans. In the late 1880s, the two Henrys, Plant and Flagler, both competed and enjoyed teasing each other with hotel and resort construction on both coasts of Florida and several inland cities that served as hubs to their railroad expansion. Certainly the most notable of these is the Tampa Bay Hotel on the Hillsborough River, now the home of the University of Tampa. In 1886, Plant purchased the Orange Grove on the site where two years later he would have rail service in place and a bridge across the river. Plant's Tampa Bay Hotel opened in 1891 and was a marvel both inside and out, and the talk of the travel trade for many years. Simultaneously, Henry was also expanding his steamship companies through merger and acquisitions to operate vessels in the northeastern waters of the United States and Canada on what became known as the Plant Line. In 1893, former President Grover Cleveland and several from his cabinet toured from Tampa to Havana as guests of Plant in what was really a forerunner to the idea of tourist cruising of the Caribbean from the Gulf of Mexico side rather than the often harsh Atlantic. It was Henry Plant's idea 
that of northern tourists being able to ride in comfort on a train with gourmet service all the way to the calm and pleasant waters of the Gulf of Mexico, and then board a luxury liner to enjoy the tropics. Cleveland said of his cruise, quote, I enjoyed the trip to Cuba greatly and do not know of a more delightful voyage than that from Port Tampa down the coast to Key West and across the channel to Havana. I was never seasick and could not have been on this voyage. Today, Henry Plant's vision of the future for a Florida tourist cruise industry is known worldwide. Three years later, in 1896, Henry Plant's 380-foot La Grande Duchesse was launched for service in the Boston area waters, and she was to be one of the largest flagship steamers in the entire country. At this time, the Plant system now owned nearly 2,000 miles of railroad track in Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida, with freight and steamship service tied to the ports of Tampa, St. Petersburg, Palatka, Sanford, Manatee, Punta Gorda, Fort Myers, Key West, Jacksonville, Savannah, Havana, Mobile, Boston, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Charlottetown, and more. Historians of Tampa's cigar heritage should know how in 1896, a looming embargo against Cuba promised to totally strangle the tobacco trade in Ybor City. In a near panic and with very little notice, Vincent Ebor of Tampa hired Plant to send the mascot and Olivet for a huge order of leaf tobacco. The ships converted quickly for a special freight run to beat the embargo deadline, canceling passenger service with refunds. Even the first-class staterooms were made use of. They delivered tremendous cargoes of tobacco and thus saved the Tampa-based cigar industry of Ebor and Tampa, Florida. Nearing the end of his life, Henry Plant had two main achievements remaining in Florida. The next year, in 1897, his company opened another resort in what was then Bel Air, now Clearwater. The Bellevue had rail service from the port in Tampa and was the longest operational Henry Plant hotel. And during the last year of his life, Henry Plant's Tampa port facilities, hotel, railroads, and steamships were all put into use by the U.S. military for troop transport and cargo supply in the Spanish-American War effort of 1898. Plant's improvements to the Tampa Bay made it deeper and superior to Miami at the time, and Tampa was the official port of embarkation during the military operations in Cuba. And his Tampa Bay Hotel was a celebrated and appreciated officer's club beyond compare. Though you might easily imagine Henry Plant to be a nose-to-the-grindstone type of unromantic soul, you would be wrong. He was a faithful husband, a dutiful father, an avid fisherman, and a fan of music and the arts. And though he was a lover of man and machine and progress, he was clearly a gentleman who valued people and relationships greatly. Henry Plant was genuinely mourned by all who knew him when he died in 1899, and it is somewhat telling of the man who as a boy dreamed of going to sea that one of Henry Plant's last dreams was his commissioning a riverboat steamer to replace the former fire victim that over 20 years prior he and his wife and son had enjoyed living aboard for 10 years from 1880 to 1890. He romantically commissioned her, but sadly did not see the H.B. Plant II launched, for she was first splashed four months after his death. She lived a while upon the waters of the Manatee River, but eventually she came home to Tampa. Henry Plant would have liked that.